Hi, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us for a virtual tour and discussion with Mermaid Hill Vineyard on growing organic grapes in New Hampshire. I'm Nikki Cole, NOFA New Hampshire's Operations Manager. And NOFA New Hampshire is the Northeast Organic Farming Association of New Hampshire. We promote organic farming, gardening, and land care practices for healthy communities. This is the third of six tours in our 2020 CRAFT program. CRAFT stands for Collaborative Regional Alliances for Farmer Training. The program focuses on peer-to-peer farmer-led education and is supported by Farm Credit Northeast Ag Enhancement. And now I'd like to introduce Nico Kimberly and Ray Connor from Mermaid Hill Vineyard. Welcome Nico and Ray. Hi everyone. Awesome, thank you so much. And so without further ado, let's take a look around Mermaid Hill Vineyard. Well, hey everybody, welcome to Mermaid Hill Vineyard. Uh, my name's Nico. I'm here uh, working here as the wine grower. Uh, it means I grow the grapes here. Uh, we also produce wine here at uh, our winery just uh, on the other side of the vineyard here. Uh, we are growing organically, uh, which is uh, the only vineyard in New Hampshire practicing organic grape growing. Uh, we have two acres uh, under vine of the Grape Marquette, which you can see here. Uh, this is a red grape uh, that is coming from the University of Minnesota. We also have uh, a quarter acre of white grapes that are just down there. Uh, the two varieties there are Lacadie and Itasca. Uh, all of these grapes are what are what known as uh, hybrid grape varieties. So uh, a hybrid grape is a cross between European grape DNA uh, as well as Native American grape DNA. So um, in this case with the Marquette, Pinot Noir is providing the European DNA, gives that really kind of familiar wine taste to the grape. Um, however, about 60% of the genetics are coming from wild grape varieties, um, Vitis riparia, and Vitis avestialis are some of the main uh, grapes in their lineage. Um, the reason that's important is the American DNA allows these grapes to survive our really cold winters here. Uh, and without that, the, just if we planted Pinot Noir, for example, that would die um, because it's so cold. So these grapes have a really interesting lineage. They were developed uh, using old school breeding techniques by the University of Minnesota. It takes about 20 years to develop a variety like this. Um, when it's all said and done. Uh, and these grapes kind of have this feeling of being both wild and cultivated um, because they have that wild DNA and that kind of cultivated DNA in them. So in our agriculture here, we seek to balance the wild and the cultivated elements. Um, we are, uh, as I said before, making our own wine here as well. Um, that's why I use the term wine grower. It's somebody who grows the wine. Uh, so we use only the grapes that we harvest uh, from this vineyard that we farmed ourselves. That allows us to really uh, take care of our plants the way we want to and make sure that the quality of the grapes going into the wine is extremely high. Um, we are selling the wine here during the weekends on tasting. So we're doing uh, Saturday and Sunday uh, appointment by uh, appointment tastings, um, coming through for people to come have a visit, uh, have a taste, take a tour. Um, and we're also selling in a few markets, so Werner Publ Public Market uh, down at uh, the Concord Co-op, and we're working on getting into a few restaurants right now. Revival is the main restaurant that carries our wine. So Mermaid Hill has been in operation uh, since 2016. Uh, the current ownership took over in 2018, and that's when uh, we made the transition to farming organically. Um, Prior to that, the vineyard was conventionally managed. Uh, there's a lot of Roundup being sprayed both on and underneath the vines. Um, and when it was taken over in 2018, there's actually so much dust here that you couldn't mow the lawn without wearing a dust mask. Um, there's that much bare soil and earth. Um, and so in 2018, uh, made the choice to convert to organic agriculture. And we're still in that conversion process, um, probably for the next five years or so, I would say, um, until we can really bring this ecosystem back into balance. Um, so when we're talking about what we do here, we're really focused on uh, a holistic type of farming that's not just farming the grapes, um, but is 
paying attention to what's growing under the grapes, what's growing in between the rows, what's growing in the buffer zones between the vineyard and the forest, um, and managing all of those, including managing the forest itself and uh, working to remove invasive species, um, especially bindweed uh, and some a lot of bittersweet actually um, mitigating that uh, from invading the vineyard. Um, this holistic approach is something that I learned uh, in my internship for two years with a biodynamic wine grower in Vermont. Um, what is really important to, to say is that biodynamics really encourages uh, an individual to learn exactly what a, a site needs. And uh, rather than being a prescribed list of rules or regulations that you must follow, the, the idea is that you instead read the landscape and learn from the landscape um, about how you might want to interact with that landscape and farm uh, in a way that's being sensitive to the other needs of the landscape other than just your crop. Uh, so uh, what, what I've learned in this vineyard here is that there are distinct zones of the vineyard. Um, each zone has a different soil quality, gets a different amount of sunlight, um, and that's actually broken down into probably, I'd say, almost 10 distinct zones in my own mind, um, which is will probably increase with time as I learn more about the site. Um, but in terms of a vineyard site uh, here in New Hampshire, um, we have really good soil for growing grapes. Most of the soil is well-drained, sandy loam, um, and grapes love that because they don't like to be around a lot of wet. Um, the number one challenge we deal with here is uh, fungal disease on both the leaves and the shoots as well as the berries uh, and we manage that fungal disease uh, as part of our ecosystem management so we mow when we think we need to mow to take some moisture out of the soil um, to increase air flow through the vineyard so we did have a wet patch right in the beginning of July when we finally got some rain um, and that's when I made the decision to mow all of the rows so Everything was unmowed up until then and hasn't been mowed since, since it's been dry since then. But mowing at that time, right after a lot of rain, um, really helped take some moisture out of the soil and force the vines and the grass to suck up more of that moisture, um, reduce the amount of humidity in the vineyard, but it also allowed for better airflow down the row. So especially as we started to get into uh, July, where the days were hot but the nights were cool, we'd allow some of that air to drain down the rows a little bit easier. Um, so that's one example of, of the way that we're, we're using the, the landscape to manage the plants without actually doing anything to the vine itself. Um, keeping that in mind, we want to keep the, the landscape in a, in a kind of balance. So we do allow uh, some of our, the flowers that we really like to stay and go to seed. Um, so this year we've made a really concerted effort uh, towards that. Um, the, the advantage to that is that, like I mentioned, all that dusty bare earth, there's still a lot of that, even where I'm standing, um, you know, everything isn't completely covered by something living. Um, so, you know, part of our management strategy is around allowing things to go to seed, um, increasing the biodiversity here as well. Let's head into the vines and uh, take a closer look. All right, so welcome to the old vineyard. Uh, this is the oldest planting here at uh, Mermaid Hill Vineyard. It was planted in 2012. Uh, that was the first year that the Marquette grape was released. Uh, so these are the oldest vines that we have and will ever have of this grape. Um, one of the things I wanted to talk about here was the life cycle of the grapevine um, throughout the year. Uh, so right now we're in a period that's really special. It's called Verizon. Uh, as you can see here, we've got some bunches that are uh, starting to turn color. And once we see this, uh, we know that we're getting ready to harvest. Um, we harvest once a year. It typically happens at the uh, beginning of September, late September, sometimes on a really cool and wet year, kind of like last year, that might be all the way uh, into the first week of October. Um, but this year has been really hot and dry. The plants have received a lot of sunlight, um, really good growing conditions actually. Um, so we're seeing this pretty early, this change in color here. Um, so after we see this change in color, um, we're starting to think about harvest. What's going on with the plant though, um, is the plant is starting to recognize that winter is coming. It's time to start to ripen the fruit. Um, and we see the plant put more energy into the ripening process here um, by pushing tannins and phenols into those grape berries um, that cause them to turn that red color. That color will continue to deepen um, 
up until harvest, and uh, the plant will also limit the amount of vegetative growth that it does. Um, and so the, the plant is really focusing on reproduction, so making those fruit um, ripen and be attractive to birds, which soon will be netting this so they can't get them, and to us so we can make wine, that's very attractive. Um, and the, as I said, the plants are starting to balance how much vegetative growth, they're starting to stop that. Um, and the way that we can tell is we can see uh, here on this stem that there's a little bit of red starting to develop on the stem. Um, that's starting to harden off, it's starting to put more lignans into the stem, uh, into the shoot to start to make it um, become much stiffer and get ready for winter to overwinter safely. Um, and we're seeing that in all of the shoots. The leaves also get a little bit thicker and tougher um, as they're getting ready to uh, get ready to ripen that fruit and that, that toughness of the leaf, the lignification of the stem, the tannins, and the phenols going to the berries, those are all ways uh, for the plant to protect itself from disease. So this, at this point, um, August 5th, you know, we're in a really good spot where the plant is almost, I won't say immune, but it has a really good self-defense against any of those fungal diseases we talked about before. Um, so as the plant's getting ready to harden off, um, you know, it's getting ready to ripen. We, then let's say we get to a month from now, fast forward, we're out here, we're picking the grapes, we're getting ready to make the wine just over there. Um, the plant will continue to, to ripen uh, its stems, it'll continue that hardening off process. Um, and then it will go into a dormant stage, um, usually right before the first snowfall. And all the leaves will drop off and the vineyard will look essentially dead uh, for about, uh, probably about four months here, let's guess this year. Um, and during that time is when we'll start pruning. So I'll take a month off and then starting in January, um, we'll start pruning the vines. We take between 80 to 90% of all of the plant material that grew the prior year off the plant. That hard pruning really encourages the plant to produce fruit next year. Um, so that pruning is happening basically January to March. Um, late March, early April, we'll start to see the first signs of bud burst. So the buds will start bursting. Um, and then we'll start to see shoots develop soon after that. Um, and then we're really into the bulk of our farming season, especially early spring, early summer is when we're working to make sure the plants have enough protection from those fungal diseases I mentioned before. Um, the way that we're doing that here is spraying. Um, we're using only earth minerals, so copper and sulfur are the only things that are sprayed on the plants. Um, we're not using anything derived from petroleum products in our management of these plants at all, um, aside from the diesel used in the tractor that, is, that has the sprayer on it. We also make our own sprays here uh, from plants that grow in the vineyard and on the surrounding property. Um, so that's part of the biodynamic practice where we're reading what the landscape gives us and we're incorporating that into uh, our program here to help the plants feel more at home in their environment. Um, what you see here is daisy fleabane. Um, this plant is uh, an antifungal plant. It grows here abundantly, especially in this section. Um, and this section also gets a good amount of moisture. Uh, the drainage isn't super good. And so when I saw that growing here and thought about the amount of moisture, I realized that the plant was trying to say, hey, you need some antifungal in this space because of the amount of moisture. Um, so we made a tea with that, a decoction. Uh, we sprayed that in this section and other sections of the vineyard. Um, that's one example of what we incorporate. We also use stinging nettle. Uh, we use horsetail early in the season. Uh, we also use a few other plants experimentally, so yarrow, alder buckthorn. Um, and this year I also experimented with some dandelion tea. Um, so we're, we're reading the landscape, we're testing those out, um, and we're using them as this practice that, that uses the landscape within uh, how we farm um, and helps the vines feel comfortable where they live. So these vines have a lot of, as I mentioned at one point, um, native grape DNA. Those grapes uh, like to live on the edges of forests, riverbanks. Um, we try to mimic that habitat as much as we can. Um, and here we have, you know, you can see the, the ground cover is allowed to live. It's only been mowed one time. Um, we also allow the plants, the vines themselves, to grow as they want to. Um, we don't trim them at all. We don't water them at all. We allow them to be fully expressive. And you can see they're kind of, uh, they're jumping. They're, they're growing in every which direction. They're exploring all these avenues about how they might want to live. And um, something that we, we believe really strongly in here is that expressiveness. And this is what's, the example of that is this. Um, this is known as the apex bud here. It's the, it's the leaving edge of a cane that goes out um, from the plant and it explores its environment. And the way it does that is with these tendrils, which are uh, at the opposite of each leaf internode. 
Um, these actually move in a spiral pattern looking for something to grab onto. When they grab on, they grab on tight. They wrap themselves around, they pull the plant to it. Um, all conventional, conventional wine growers cut these off. Um, and they do that because the plant's getting too big. Well, the thing is, this is actually the way the plant senses whether it's getting too big or not. So if you cut this off, the plant's gonna start growing really fast because it's gonna freak out. Oh shit, somebody cut off my, you know, my sense organ, like I'm under attack, I need to expand my vegetative reach, right? Um, so they're actually in this never ending battle against constantly cutting the plants bent, the plants back, the vine's constantly growing larger. Um, but if you allow the apex bud to do its job, which is to, to know its environment, to know where it is, um, the plant finds its own balance. And you see in this, this shoot, it's not overly long, it's long enough, um, it's healthy, and it's going to be there to ripen the grapes, and all the leaves will be able to do that. So, um, you know, that's one example of how we listen to what the plants do, and we also trust the plant's intelligence. I mean, the, the genetics of this plant are, or have been evolved over thousands and thousands of years to be able to adapt to almost any climate, and so any growing situation. And so there's, there's, no, there's not a lot of place for me to say, oh, well, you don't need this anymore. There's a reason the plant has evolved to have this. Uh, and I think it's quite beautiful uh, to look in the vineyard and to see things you know, jumping and growing. And uh, it brings this kind of magic into the vineyard. And so I really believe that vineyards create their own magic. Uh, and that magic, it gets into you. All right, so uh, here we are down in the lower part of the vineyard. Uh, these are the second oldest vines that we have uh, in the whole entire vineyard and I uh, really like this area, especially this time of day uh, when the sun kind of declines and uh, filters through these vines here and uh, there's a feeling of being surrounded by the vines, uh, a feeling of capturing some sort of moment in time and when we think about wine, that's really what wine is doing is we're trying to capture what the whole entire growing season was like in one bottle. Um, and that's a, it's a really nice way to think of wine, especially from the growing perspective, because as I'm out here working with the plants every single day, um, walking the rows, looking for diseased berries on, on fruit or looking for diseased leaves with that fungal disease we're pulling off, um, doing all that work by hand, you really start to get a feeling for what it's like to be a vine, um, what, it, what different parts of the vineyard feel like for that vine to grow in. Uh, and down here, I feel like they're very jubilant and kind of wild. Um, and you can see that almost that, that wildness is uh, expressed in how ripe these berries are here. So, I mean, this, this is the, the same, same variety as uh, we saw before, but um, substantially more ripe. Um, and they're starting to swell up and get that beautiful uh, deep purple color here. Um, and part of that learning about what the plant likes to, uh, when it grows and the different sections of the vineyards is, um, it's part of what it's like to be working in perennial agriculture and um, really starting to develop a relationship with the land and the vines themselves. Um, these vines every year get touched by human hands at least 10 times, every single vine. Um, that's from the pruning, which is all done by hand, to the leaf pulling, to the tying of the canes, um, onto the trellis to give them support, um, to the removal of disease, um, and just to the curious eye as we walk to say, what is this new bug? What is this new, uh, this new spot on the leaf? Um, how are the berries doing? How are the bunches developing? Um, there's this real feeling that in this work, uh, connection with the land and with the vines starts to emerge. And, and it becomes almost like a dialogue where each year you, you try to understand how the plants are growing. You try to capture that in that bottle of wine. And then the next year, when you're going to prune, the plant says, this is how I grew last year, and this is what I liked and I didn't like. And then I respond and I say, okay, I'm gonna give you what you liked and prune this part of you this way and this part of you that way. Um, and then the next year it grows and it, it gives me feedback. And over time, a relationship really develops that uh, is wonderful. And in this work, which is hard work, as any organic farmer knows, uh, I think it's important to take the time to step back and recognize the beauty and the wonder that is part of farming, that is part of developing relationships with plants um, and the environment in which they live, um, and how that relationship with them helps us be better people um, and helps us explore every avenue uh, in which to live, much like these plants do.
So the uh, final stop in our tour is the winery. This is where we do all the work in transforming our grapes into wine. Um, the way that we do that is basically the way that old Italian peasants would do it. Um, we use really simple technology in that to, to get that transformation to where we want it to be. Um, so we do all foot stomping of the grapes. Uh, so after we harvest them, we take them off the stems um, and then we stomp them. Um, and that's a really great way to extract all of the, the wonderful flavor and color and aroma from those grapes. Um, then we use a wooden basket press to press those grapes. Um, this is a really traditional way of doing it. It provides a really slow um, and even pressing uh, of the grapes so that we don't over extract them, but we uh, make sure we do get um, as much as we can from them. Um, after that, we have juice that's fermenting, and then that goes into a number of different places depending on the wine we're making. Um, so we use glass carboys, much like this one here. Um, we also use these glass demijohns, uh, which are a really old classic shape in winemaking. Um, these are, uh, these were developed uh, by a glass blower back in the 1400s, um, and they do a really wonderful thing during the fermentation of the wine, um, where they actually create a spiral where um, the fermentation is constantly pulling the yeast back up to the top and then pushing it back under a really dynamic fermentation. Uh, something that we're doing here that's a little bit experimental is working with flex tanks in winemaking. So um, we do employ traditional barrels as well, um, but these tanks here are crafted from a food grade type of plastic that allow breathability um, in the wine without importing any of the wood taste from a barrel. Um, and these are, we really like these because they're much more cost effective than using a barrel, um, but they also provide a really unique texture um, and complexity to the wine um, without adding any other flavors. So when we think about wine, we're really trying to capture that growing season that the grapes grew in and uh, really maximize the grape taste in the wine rather than adding anything to that wine or taking any way, anything away from that wine. Um, so that means that we're only working with the wild yeast that are on the grapes when they come in to start the fermentation. Um, and we're not adding any preservatives, color additives, any of the None of the 500 legal additives to wine make it into our wine here. Um, that's again to really capture what it was like to be that grape during that growing season. Um, the rest of the space is a little bit in progress right now. Uh, part of my uh, mission here is to use appropriate technology for the winemaking. So there's a few relics from the past that are here, but uh, in general, we're working towards uh, creating a winery that is completely solar powered. Um, we're doing that through solar panels on the house. We'll be adding some more to the roof here, um, really trying to be conscious of how we're getting the energy that we're using to make this wine. Um, that's really about it. Uh, that's, this is where I'd end the tour. And if you were here with me in person, I would offer you a glass of wine and we would drink one together. Uh, I can't do that, but I can show you at least what it would look like and what I would open for you. Uh, so this is our 2018. Uh, red wine made from all of our grapes here. Um, it's really bright and fruity and would be great to drink on this hot day. Uh, so come by sometime and open one up and let's hang out. Cheers. Awesome, thank you. Um, great, I just have to on a different view here. Wonderful. So, uh, Miko and Ray, did you have anything that you wanted to say after watching the video? Or I'm happy to go into some questions that I have. Uh, I would just say thanks everyone for watching and joining us. Uh, I'm glad mm -hmm. to see a few people drinking wine out there. So, cheers. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah, and I just want to add, I thought the film itself was really beautiful, and I appreciate the artistic talents of your partner. Thank you. Yeah. I really enjoyed the tour, too. Well, awesome. So um, let's see here. So for everyone, as you have questions, please put them into the chat box if you joined after I had my spiel saying that. But I'm happy to open with a couple questions. 
Um, so Nico, I know that you gave us a little bit of your background in the video, but I wondered mm -hmm. if, um, if both Nico and Ray would like to share more about your farming background with us. Yeah, of course. Uh, so I started in the farming world back uh, when I was in college and I, I spent some time on a biodynamic farm and uh, that was my first introduction to kind of uh, that style of farming. Uh, and I, I studied organic agriculture in my studies in college. So there was uh, some academic interest there mixed with a small amount of practical uh, experience. Uh, but it wasn't until 2017 uh, where I moved out to uh, Williamstown, Massachusetts to work as a cheesemaker there, um, first as an apprentice and then as the cheesemaker. Um, I spent a year doing that and I really loved the rural lifestyle and the farming life. Uh, so I decided to continue in that, um, but looking for a, a job uh, in farming that was more outdoor focused. Uh, and I found that in, in an internship up in Vermont uh, where I uh, had the opportunity to plant a vineyard and then was came on board as a full-time intern to really learn uh, a lot more about what the farming work was like. Um, and that, that took me about two years of, of time. And then uh, during that time, I also worked for a wine bar to continue learning about wine. Um, and then I, I met Ray through a friend who had visited another vineyard here in New Hampshire. Uh, and as the only organic grower, it seemed like a pretty good fit. And uh, yeah, well, things worked out in a wonderful way and uh, I'm here today. So it's uh, pretty great. Yeah, and my um, organic farming experience started just after call in college through permaculture. I took permaculture courses and planted, you know, perennial food forests and stuff in college and then proceeded to take off on a sailboat for a while but managed to convince the captain to steer toward more farms. So I kind of cruised coastal farms for years, um, traveling south for the winter to Florida where I'm from and to Martha's Vineyard essentially and, and Pennsylvania. There was two farms I worked on. Um, and I actually fell in love with animal work um, after being a vegetarian for a long time, but partly because I really appreciated soil dynamics and pasture land management. Um, I just found it to be so interesting versus like annual vegetable production, which I found hard. Um, and it still is, and I still love it in a smaller fashion. Um, I moved to New Hampshire and started a small permaculture farm in 2010 and worked for NOFA New Hampshire for many years and got to tour the state and meet incredible growers, um, state and regionally. And um, I was inspired a lot by those folks. Um, but unfortunately wasn't able to continue farming. And then my goodness, three years later, my partner found this vineyard and I thought that's not something I wanna do um, because it's a lot of work and everybody says it's not possible to do organically. So you hear a lot of the rhetoric around it's not possible to do this organically. Um, and so the first two seasons was me managing it primarily um, and it was a lot of work. And I met Nico last summer and we connected and talked and he like immediately inspired me with some ideas that I immediately followed through with made my first natural wine last season which I just bottled Sunday and is very drinkable um, but very, very basically challenged me and pushed me into making wine the way I farm um, and so that's the direction we're headed as a as a vineyard and as a winery um, and honestly, like when I watched that video, I thought, oh man, I'm back at permaculture. I'm so happy back at perennial agriculture. We're going to get some sheep next spring. And I've been working chickens through the understory sort of experimentally while I'm in grad school, but excited about bringing animals back into the picture. Yeah, those animals have been a huge help for us. Yeah. We, had a, we had a little, uh, the climbing cutworm come after our, our newly emerging buds, which is a not a really great thing because uh, this buds are where all the fruit comes from. Yeah. And so uh, Ray said, well, why don't we put the chickens in there and let them go after it and uh, definitely helped. So uh, yeah, it's, it's been, it's been neat to learn from Ray about how animals can be integrated into the system more. Um, and that's something like you mentioned with the sheep, we definitely want to do more of, uh, especially given uh, the fact that a lot of the topsoil that was removed here 
um, during the initial planting and clearing of this land. So we need, we have some soil building to do. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you both. It was really great to learn more about um, what you've been doing over the years and how that led you to where you are now. So I have just one more question and I see some other questions are coming in, but I just wanted to ask, um, so what other um, crops and fruits are you growing and what other products are you working on right now or this year that you'd like to share about? Well, Ray can tell you all about the vegetable garden she's planted. Uh, and, and like completely mismanaged this year. So um, I, I envision a little bit more vegetable production, but we have Worksong Farm right next door and I feel very much like in good hands with them as growers. So I'm again, focused on animal agriculture. Right now I sell organic eggs, not certified, so I shouldn't say that. Um, I sell eggs that were fed organically and pasture raised. Um, and I, we produce honey from our bees, which is um, also a new venture. Um, and I have a couple friends who are our bee growers, um, cause I definitely don't pretend that I'm an expert at that, but they're doing it completely naturally. Um, they've not used anything that's not on NOP list for beekeeping. Um, so some honey, um, but mostly, you know, the thing that we've started to develop this year, that's different from just straight wine. Um, and then the future of animal production is experiences. Um, we just opened for Friday night wine bars and we're in collaboration with some local musicians. The COVID's really made like, I think Nico and I, I don't want to speak for you, Nico, but like it was really lonely in the beginning and we've had to like adapt to how do we create social spaces and experiences within agriculture and then on this space because it's open and available. So we're also cultivating um, more of a community feel through like Friday night wine bars, bringing local musicians and artists to the space. Um, so I wanted to add that because um, a lot of us agriculturalists and farmers have to also um, in, in, in engage in other, in other business ventures to make things work and also to have a social life during the season. Yeah, and one thing I'll add to that is also we're expanding what we make to uh, kind of broad, more broadly encompass what, um, what is possible with these grapes and with the, the soil and the climate that we have here. So uh, we'll be making some sparkling wine this year. We'll be making uh, our first white wine. Uh, and we'll also be making some ciders um, with the small orchard next door and as well as with a collaboration with um, an old orchard that we're helping rehabilitate and kind of reinvigorate um, just nearby in Hopkinton. So looking to also uh, to share more about, you know, what other perennial uh, fruits have to say in this, this part of New Hampshire. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, so I saw that someone had a comment, um, just like a technical thing, that some people didn't receive um, the Zoom link. So thank you all for getting here uh, through various channels. I'm sorry if anyone had technical difficulties and thank you for bringing that up. Um, and now I see some questions from our attendees. So uh, the first one is, what different species are you growing in the understory and in your buffers? Good question. Um, so the, the main, there's one kind of main buffer zone. Um, there's a lot of Queen Anne's lace growing there and goldenrod. Um, we've seen, and, and there's some daisy flea vein, but not quite as much. Um, in terms of what's, mo what's under vines, um, there's some vetch, some purple vetch and pink vetch that uh, was seeded, um, I think Ray last seeded. Year. Yeah, it was last year. Um, so we did, so Ray did do some cover cropping in specific parts of the vineyard. Um, and we've also seeded clover, I think each year, right? Um, yep. Um, so that, that's, that's a, that's a definitely a big one for us. Um, there's and also- And um, tailored radish were in a lot of the mixes. Right. So getting some penetration, it was pretty compact in a lot of the spaces. Yeah, so there's a lot of, uh, a lot of, heavy machinery used in the past. And so we've really reduced the, the usage of, of machines in the vineyard to what extent we can. Um, and by planting those um, kind of deep rooting plants, we're helping open up the soil. Also did some broad forking in certain areas. Um, we're kind of at a stage where whatever wants to sow its seeds can grow as long as it's not something we don't like. So 
Um, there is some thistle that's starting to come in that we've removed. Um, there's a lot of dewberry, which is a native, but uh, it's quite spiky. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So uh, that's going to stay because you know it's part of the landscape. Um, but yeah, we're really we're really kind of in like I mentioned in the video this this rehabilitation phase where we want to have living things under the vine. Um, to what extent that green manure can be there, and then over time, kind of tweak that to be maybe more finely tuned. Um, it's also exciting to see what grows in different parts. There's this uh, toad flax that's been growing in certain parts. It's super pretty, and the pollinators seem to love it. Um, even though it's not a, a native, it's it's something that I'm okay with being there because, man, the bees are all over it. So uh, it's kind of a fun one. There's also a thing called tower mustard that's another um, non-native, um, super beautiful and really awesome uh, growing in certain spots. And then a lot of mullein. Um, yeah mugwort in some of the high Japanese beetle, beetle pressure areas, which is interesting. Um, that covers most of it. Oh, the, oh, there's some, uh, there's some chicory too, some purple, purple flower chicory growing. It's really nice. Awesome. Thank you. So another question that we have is, um, how long did you spend surveying land before you were able to decide on the site for your vineyard and what sort of resources did you utilize in assisting with the land search? You should speak to your other spot maybe for that because we don't have that here. Yeah, yeah so this was, since, since it was acquired um, after being planted, uh, I don't know much about how this site was selected. Whether it was intentional or not, it's a very good site. Um, south facing, sunny slope, good air drainage, um, you know, good, good soil drainage. Um, I, I've selected a site for an additional vineyard planting out in Marlboro, New Hampshire, um, with similar criteria. So, you know, it's really important to have um, enough sunlight here for ripening, um, but also to keep the, keep the sun, you know, on the vineyard to dry it out um, from morning dew or rains. Um, so I selected a slope that's pretty broad. It's actually broader and larger than this. Um, steeper than this and at a higher elevation. So um, we like the elevation for protection from frosts. Um, and the steepness is something that, you know, really challenges the grapevines. Um, vines like a hill, it's one of the oldest uh, <laughs> adages about grapevines uh, to grow on. Um, and the soil type, I mean, New Hampshire, most New Hampshire soil types are great. Um, this this well-drained sandy loam is loose enough that allows for soil, you know, root penetration. Um, and is well drained enough that the grapes aren't sitting in standing water. Um, so where, where I learned in Vermont, there's a lot of heavy clay and that definitely presented some problems. Um, there's also the, the factor of wind, which isn't something you can necessarily control, but wind is nice because it dries out the plants as well. Um, you know, when we talk about disease, we talk about leaf wetness time. You know, it takes six hours of leaf wetness for X disease to begin to sporulate, right? So the more things that dry out the plants, the better. Um, I believe the wind at this site is actually so high that it's a limiting factor. So it definitely limits the vigor of the plants. Uh, and, you know, in a way that's nice because the, the hybrids that were developed um, are very vigorous, they grow a lot. Uh, so um, limiting factors are also part of built into that vineyard design. So, um, the, the main takeaway is you don't want your vines to be babied. Uh, they should struggle a little bit because that makes more interesting wine and it forces their roots to go deeper uh, and explore the soil more, take up more minerals, look for water, um, helps them be more resilient. You know, this year in a, a very dry year, we've only had two plants die because these plants or roots are deep. They found the water, you know. Um, so that type of resiliency, you know, we build in when we choose our, a good vineyard site. Awesome, thank you. You're welcome. All right, find the next question here. Okay, who do you recommend as suppliers for cold, hardy wine grape starts? Uh, a Andy Farmer up at Northeast Vine Supply in Vermont is the go-to guy. He's great. Um, I'd recommend him. Yeah, definitely. If if you want, uh, if you want like really specialty stuff. Um, you know, I'm happy to connect with you offline. And there's a few 
uh, breeders who are doing hybrid breeding work, uh, hybrids, and there's also some folks who are growing really old, like almost what we call an heirloom variety that um, we planted a few of this year and they're growing really well. So um, for like the commercial varieties, Andy is definitely the guy, but um, I'm happy to connect offline with, uh, who am I? Oh, I can't see who said that, Todd's. Um, Maybe we, we could get in touch somehow. Uh, but yeah, there, there's lots of options out there, but Andy's the go-to guy. And typically to order, you order in like the, the late fall, early winter, and then there's a short shipping window um, because they need to be planted basically between June 1st and July 1st for them to survive. Um, yeah, if, if, uh, if you wanna message me privately, Todd's, I can share info and we can talk more. Thank you. All right. So for the sprays that you use, such as the daisy flea bane, were you basing this primarily on listening to the plants and observations, et cetera? Or did you already have knowledge of which plants might be useful, such as having antifungal properties? That's a great question. Um, it's a little bit of both. Uh, so uh, my, my mentor in Vermont was um, was adamant about learning every species that grew in your vineyard because what grows there shows you what the soil is like um, and shows you what the climate um, and that soil combined together produce, you know, what, what, what can grow and thrive in that environment. So um, it's kind of like reading the landscape, right? Um, so it's, you know, I, when, I, when I got here um, in March, not much was growing, but as things started to push up, I spent a lot of time learning everything that was growing in different parts of the vineyard. Um, I did have some knowledge of what each plant species might do for in terms of managing the vine. So I did, I did know that daisy fleabane was an antifungal plant, um, but I actually hadn't worked with it before because it wasn't growing uh, extensively in the vineyard that I used to help manage. Um, so it's kind of a little bit of both. Um, there's a really wonderful book called the Biodynamic Manual that I have. Um, and biodynamics is something that I, I hesitate to talk a lot about because people have preconceived notions, but I see it as a, a, a way to see an ecosystem as a, a dynamic biological or ecological system, right? So um, it's about understanding that everything works together to create an ecosystem and uh, this book is one of the few biodynamic books that's written in a way that anyone can understand with pl practical applications. Uh, and, and that book is a wealth of knowledge and a lot of growers in Europe have worked with biodynamics and vineyards for a long time. And so it's kind of like a compendium of what people have tried and what's worked. And so, um, you know, th those two things plus, plus learning, you know, like I didn't know Alder Buckthorn before this year, but I saw it when I was looking for elderberry and I was like, this is an interesting plant. Uh, and my partner said, well, actually that's a, a, a non-native. We may want to remove it. So we started cutting it down. And then that same day I saw some fungal pressure starting to happen. And um, I was looking through my, my manual about like what book or what uh, plant might I use. And I saw elder buckthorn and I said, oh, wow, I just found that on the property. Huh, maybe I should experiment with that. Maybe that means something. Um, and so, you know, made a tea from that and, and experimented. And, you know, this year was, um, there was, it was a pretty dry year. So I can't say anything conclusive, like, you know, it was the best thing that worked, but I will say that everything that we worked with as a whole this year allowed for the plants to be healthy and produce a good crop. Um, so in that holistic way, um, that worked pretty well. Great. And then we have another question um, from one of Nico's older professors, former professors, um, who says, what kind of reviews are you getting from the experts? This is a two part question. What kind of reviews are you getting from the experts? And also how much did you, your experience in Italy influence your life choice? Well, first of all, I have to say, hi, I haven't seen you in a while. And it's wonderful that you joined. That's awesome. <laughs> So uh, Professor Zidansky is one of my favorite professors I had. And uh, a little background is we spent, uh, we spent two weeks in Italy together as part of a travel program um, with the university I attended. And 
Uh, that was focused on learning about ceramic production in central Italy, um, in the Umbria region. Um, and we stayed with an artist for seven days. And uh, there, is, there is an important antidote about wine that comes into play here that, um, you know, while we were staying with this artist, he had a, uh, <laughs> cheers, yeah. Uh, he had this wonderful uh, obsession with ping pong. And um, we would play ping pong after we'd spend all day making pottery. And uh, the part of that ping pong was drinking wine and the wine was coming from one of his friends who had just made it. I mean, we were there in the spring, so it was young wine and it was like this deep purple and this, intense you know it was still rough and rustic it wasn't like refined and smooth and i remember drinking copious amounts of it and playing ping pong and then attempting to cook risotto uh which is very difficult to do <laughs> when you haven't been drinking wine but especially after um and i would say that uh that that experience in the whole italian philosophy towards life which is um uh, to enjoy food with wine is one of the uh you know, one of the joys of life and that, uh, that everything in, in that culture is integrated in some way. So, you know, working with, um, you know, the person who made the vines was friends with the person who made the pottery and they would exchange those things uh, as friends, um, as gifts and um, as our, as guests, we got to experience them and experience that joy uh, that comes from that. And um, you know, the Italians have this way of living that is not taking things too seriously um, and that, that is really respectful of the earth in this kind of way that is like, it's built into their culture. Like people there aren't like, oh, I'm an organic grower. They're like, well, this is the way we've always worked with the plants. Um, you know, this is the way we've always worked with the earth and grown things here. Um, uh, as as a relatively poor country, farming has been a way of life for a long time. Um, and, you know, I've been inspired by those people who, uh, you know, they're not driving Ferraris or um, living in big houses, but they have all of the abundance, all of the wealth that they need, which is food and wine and good people and uh, a love for life and and for art. And so, you know, that's an inspiring thing for me as a, as a grower because, um, you know, we, we work a lot and we, uh, we also get to enjoy the things that we make and the, the lifestyle and the culture that surrounds, uh, that surrounds wine is something that I, that I want to bring to, to the Northeast, bring to New Hampshire to, to remind people that wine is, is made by farmers. Wine is not a fancy thing. It's, it comes from plants, it comes from agriculture, it comes from hard work, uh, it comes from the earth and it should stay close to the earth. It doesn't need to be in the upper echelons of society somewhere. Um, and that, that grounded philosophy is really, is coming from, from Italy and from my experiences there. Um, and, you know, also, also the idea that, uh, that anything is possible, I think comes, comes from those experiences that um, you know, it's, it's possible to be an artist and, and live a, a good life, um, even though, you know, artists aren't known to be, you know, powerful figures in society or, you know, it's, it's possible to be a, a farmer and have a good life. You know, these things that uh, maybe I didn't think were possible before I left to, to have those experiences all of a sudden became reality and said, oh, I could do that. Wow, I could do that. That'd be cool. Um, so I think that's a... Uh, I think that's a big, yeah, a big part of the influence, uh, to be sure. Nico, I feel like I need to clarify that you spent more than two weeks there on vacation. Like you ended up spending a number of years there and learning the language. Because I think if you just thought, oh, he was there for two weeks, <laughs> you're like, right, that's, <laughs> yeah. so sore, right. my bones, two weeks. And I'm like, oh, no, he lived there. Um, that's true. Yeah. So it was an American university, a four-year university there with a focus on traveling, um, and learning culture by experiencing. So traveling to a place and living there to experience it. Um, so yeah, thank you, Ray. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you both for that. That was great and wonderful. Um, and so we have another question here. What has the learning curve been like for winemaking? You both kind of alluded to that before. 
Yeah. So the way that I approach, you know, wine is um, in the cellar is that the, the most of the work should occur with the plants in the vineyard. And, you know, a lot of people say that. Um, I, I mean, I'm not saying that, uh, you know, everyone and everyone goes about it differently. Right. Um, but for me, um, if I do all the things right in the vineyard and I'm making sure the plants are happy and healthy and they're vibrant and um, they're expressive, right? All of those things are going to translate into the wine uh, and into the grapes. And it's my job to kind of just, uh, I'm kind of like the plant's legs, right? The plants can't get up and move around. They can't pick the berries and drop them in the tank, but you know, I can do those things for them. Um, so, uh, my, my goal is to not really, um, uh, it's not really do too much to the grapes and try to express them as much as I can, um, through really simple technologies and techniques, as I mentioned in the, in the tour. Um, the, now the learning curve is of course, uh, I don't want to say it's steep because, um, the, the way that I think about it is there's, there's like, um, there's certain things in fermentation you have to learn about, like how does fermentation work? Um, and what are the parameters in which, specifically what are the parameters in which fermentation operates best? And that's um, temperature and time um, and it's observation. So it's the same things that we use to, to analyze the vineyard when I walk through the vines, like what is the temperature outside? What's the humidity? How are the plants reacting to that? Um, and when I'm, when I'm working with the, the grapes themselves, um, there, there's a specific like intuitive aspect I'll say that I have with fermentation. I, the whole reason I went to go make cheese is because I started making, started fermenting milk uh, uh, in my, my office cubicle at, at work. Um, trying to make raw milk cheese uh, in a temperature controlled environment. And, you know, the, the best temperature control is the office here that was always 72 degrees. And if I put the milk on there, it would culture it the exact same way every time. Um, so like I, you learn things about fermentation and specifically wild fermentation, which is what we work with. Um, you start to get a feel for what works and what doesn't. So like in a really hot fermentation, things start to taste different than a really cold fermentation. And then there's like a specific in between that's like the optimal fermentation temperature. Um, I would say that, you know, it comes with experience and observation. So when I, the first batch of wine I ever made, um, I still have some of it. I won't say it's the best thing I ever made, but I also didn't mess it up. Um, you know, and it, and it took me observing it and tasting it a lot, like, and Ray will, uh, uh, I think, have something to say about that too, like tasting, 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 gathering data points, you know, uh, in, in this type of farming, we're not, well, we are, we are scientists, right, but, but we don't use, uh, you know, scientific instruments that are machines, we use the, the scientific instruments of our, our senses, right, I refer to this as sensory winemaking sometimes, where the data we gather is what does it taste like? What does it smell like? What does it sound like um, mm -hmm. when it's fermenting, right? Those are all things that, um, that, are, that are tied to intuition in a specific way. So the more that you gain those data points, the more clearly you're able to say, okay, this intuitively feels right or doesn't because I've, I've gained all these data points about how things like to ferment. Um, you know, and it's also learning the specific techniques. So in, in wild fermentation, there's a lot of different techniques you use depending on the quality of the fruit that comes in, the temperature outside, um, what, how much time you have to make the wine. Like you may have to make it faster or slower. This year has been really hot. We're using a specific technique known as whole cluster fermentation where we keep the berries on the stems and we don't remove them during the fermentation. And, that, and then we slowly break the berries over time that creates a slower fermentation, um, even though it's really hot, otherwise fermentations would happen really quickly. So there's, it's a combination of observation, intuition, and technique that I, I would say, um, yeah, is kind of the learning curve. I mean, you just gotta do it too. I mean, it's experiential, yeah. right? <laughs> I mean, Ray said, you know, it's, she made her first wine last year. I think you should have to talk a little about that because it's been cool to hear you. Yeah, I was going to say, like, Mike's, my learning curve has been weird because I started with a conventional winemaker. 
and um, really large stainless tanks and very large crushers and pumps and huge fermenters. It was a very like, um, it's like a fa it was like factory experience. Like, okay, we're gonna harvest all the grapes. We're gonna dump them in here. This gonna crush, we're gonna move. We're gonna... And then we pitched yeast and we, you know, took temperature measurements and we, you know, ch charted everything. And, uh, and to be honest, I did not enjoy it or think it was interesting. Um, so that speaks to something, I guess. Um, so I'd spent two years kind of learning just like a framework that I was just not that interested in. Um, and, and the wine's okay, for sure. I think it's yummy, um, but I decided I wanted to make some of my own wine and I wanted to use different kind of like, you know, a different approach. I wanted to do wild ferment and taste what these grapes said to me. Um, and so cleanliness was something that was very, very important, you know, just like basic. So like I learned how to do like really good cleaning, um, how to like pick the fruit well, and then, and then how to kind of observe and watch and like figure out when to rack and, and, and make the changes that I had to make happen. But what I really learned over the past year and a little bit is trusting wine, right? So my former winemaker um, wasn't trusting. He was like measuring and like using lots of implements and testing and, and all the time, like I didn't know what was happening except what, you know, the data said or something, right? And, and I got scared and I was worried and I was stressed. And then Nico came on board and here's my wild wine and we just tasted a lot. And what I learned was that it changes a lot and that the way that it tastes one month changes dramatically from the way it tastes the next month and the next. And that there's this sort of like movement of flavors into a stability. And then when you send stability, you start like kind of being like, okay, here we are. Like this starts to like have its own kind of identity and then that identity is a little consistent and and all that crazy that went on before used to scare me and now that crazy doesn't scare me unless it's disgusting which it hasn't been fortunately in any of the wines we've done and tried um but could and now i think i i will know that a little more like i'll be able to smell and taste that a little more and see that a little more um so that's my experience and i like it way better it's more fun well the wine is alive right we're, yeah. we're dealing with a living product i mean and, and that's where you have all the variations and those variations are like anything that's alive, everything, every human too, like ups and downs, but eventually you find, you figure out what you want to be and the wine has that same kind of trajectory. And, yeah. um, you know, the grapes want to turn into wine. Like yeah. they, there's a reason that the wild yeast exists that convert them to wine. Like that's, <laughs> you know, <laughs> there's a, there's definitely a reason that's connected. And I, and I think it might be a good time to show you this. Um, so this is what a uh, fermentation looks like. And I don't know how well you can see it, but there's some bubbling action happening here. A lot of movement. It's really cool. I don't know if, it's, if you're able to see it. I can't really see, but it's bubbling. I don't know. Well, in any case, um, come by and see a wild <laughs> fermentation. It's yeah, wild. It's really beautiful. <laughs> well, thank you so much. I can't believe it, but it's one minute to eight o'clock. We had such a great conversation. Uh, thank you so much. I'm just going to put up one closing screen here. Nikki, could I man mention one thing? Yes, please. If you all visit the vineyard this season and say you were in this uh, tour, Feel free to get a discount on a glass or a bottle of wine of a couple bucks. Um, just let us know you were here and then bring your questions. The wine bar is open Fridays from five to eight. It's like a happy hour after work schedule. Awesome. Do you have to make an appointment? Um, we prefer reservations because during COVID we're limiting people. Um, so far it's only been three weeks so we haven't gotten to capacity yet but we're yeah, give us a call. We might be at capacity this week. I'm not sure. Awesome. Thank you. That's really, that's really wonderful. Thank you. for sharing. Thanks everyone for joining. This has yeah. been great. Thanks for the good questions too. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you everyone again. Um, I hope you can see the screen that I just put up and I saw that one person had asked if this uh, recording would be shared. It will be shared later um, after all of the craft tours are completed later in the fall. So if you're on our mailing list, um, you will hear about that. And if you've 
uh, haven't been able to attend any of the other tours, but still wanted to see them, um, you know, check for that, that mailing later. Uh, but yeah, so that this concludes our tour and discussion with Mermaid Hill Vineyard. I think, like I said, this time went by really fast. And I want to thank Nico and Ray again um, for showing us around the vineyard and answering all our questions. Um, I think this was a really great tour and wonderful conversation. And if you did like the tour, you can support Nofa New Hampshire by becoming a member or making a donation. And the links to do that are up on the screen that I've put up there. And please do mark your calendars for our next virtual craft tour, which is going to be with Kearsarge Gore Farm on September 9th at 7 p.m. And that is about four season farming. And thank you again for spending your evening with us. I hope everyone has a great night. Thank you so thank much. You, yeah. Thank you all. Bye, everyone. Bye. See you later. Bye.